Oh, some random geek says all gamers hate DMR. Yeah, I would imagine most <laughs> do, right? Because yeah. again, it doesn't allow you to do certain things. You have to do things certain ways. Um, or if you don't, you break a warranty or you fuck up your device. Like there's all kinds of things that if you try to jailbreak it or you try to do something with it, you can't. We were talking and, about, uh, uh, you mentioned that you just got uh, a copy of Radicalized by Cory yeah. Doctorow. And yeah. there's a, there's one of those, uh, one of the chapters or little short stories in that book is about like toasters that have <laughs> that are digitally locked in the That's fine. All right, we're live. Hi and welcome to Red Reviews. Um this is uh number 38 uh with my friend Justin Clark. Hi, Corey. How's it going? Oh, it's going all right. How about yourself? <laughs> I'm fine. I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I like your, I mean, I'm sorry you're not feeling <laughs> great, but I'm liking your voice though. It's kind of yeah, like. It sounds different, eh? <laughs> yeah. It's like, um, it's like Corey after hours. Right. <laughs> just feels like people are just, unfortunately, people are getting, getting, it's those summer bugs, man. You know, yeah. my wife's d dealing with a sinus infection right now, so. I Jeez. still, part of me still thinks that this is a product of the smoke from a few days ago. Uh, yeah. So I'm not entirely sure, but I, I kind of feel like it's just gotten kind of worse. Filled my lungs right. up, made my throat all raw. And <sighs> oh, that's awful. That's awful. <laughs> yeah. you're, Cause you're, you I mean, you're, you're, you're inhaling decayed tree dust. So, you know, it's like, it's not great. It's not what lungs are supposed to do. No, 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 no. The alveoli will thank you once. Yeah. <laughs> so once, you're, once the smoke is gone, the smoke has been truly horrible. I mean, I don't know how many miles I live away from you, but but I mean, but it's it's I'm we're still dealing with the haze here. Right. Well, it's and kind of dissipated here the last few days. We haven't had too much, so it's that's good. Better. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's starting to get better on our end too. Fortunately, um, it was it was so thick here for a few days that I could I could like see smoke across the street. Whoa! So, so it was it was pretty bad. That's pretty intense. Um. So yeah. So uh. Yeah. Hopefully that all will get better soon. <laughs> I really hope so. Honestly, like in terms of weather, this summer has been absolute shit. Like it's been terrible. Right. Awful. You guys had, you've had some hot and then some rain and like. Yeah. We've yeah. had hot, we've had rain, we've had humidity, then we've had the haze, then we've had <laughs> like ozone, like, uh, like ozone warnings. And it's just, it's terrible. I mean, I think it's, you know, we are the generation that is going to have to live with climate change. I mean, this is the reality. And, and I think that we have to. I don't know. Like, I, I know that there's a lot of love for people who are like, well, we need to, you know, we need to think about the future and we need to, and, and I totally agree. Or like, we want to get back to like pristine nature. And it's like, that's gone. That's not yeah, happening. It doesn't happen. Yeah. Well, first off, pristine nature is largely a myth. I mean, it's like, right. there's, you know, um, as long as there's been nature, there've been animals manipulating it for their own purposes. So, yeah. you know, it's not like, um, it's not like that. Like, and some of this is unavoidable due to the use of hydrocarbons. Um, but I think this is, we're now living in the era where it's like, we're not only going to have to try to mitigate the, um, the, the growth of warming, but we're also going to have to mitigate the effects of it. You know, we're right. going to have to start. I was thinking about that the other day, you know, as I think I mentioned this earlier this week or something, but like my love for science fiction, ah, some random geek has joined us. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. <laughs> yes, the communist socialist propaganda transmission has begun. Yes. This is my second interview today uh, or my second kind of live stream today or whatever. I did an interview with Indiana Public Broadcasting today about oh, cool. unions. And I, wrote, I talked about the history of unions in Indiana and, and how the union movement can learn from uh, – past labor struggles in Indiana and around the country. So that was nice. fun. It was, you know, they don't get full Justin like y'all do, but <laughs> you get, you get, you get a more tempered Justin. Right. Right. 
But even, oh, like, but I would imagine, you know, uh, Justin with just a bit of chaser is still probably too intense from, from <laughs> 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 but, um, but yeah, so for Indiana and, public, for Indiana public broadcast. broadcasting, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, we're definitely going to be talking about choke point capitalism tonight. Really excited about talking about it. Um, but before we get started, I just wanted to mention we're recording this on July 20th. Today is the three year anniversary, for third year anniversary of the passage of my passing of Michael Brooks, mm -hmm. um, who was an incredible thinker and author and broadcaster in his own right. Um, I think there's a very good shot. There's a very good, case to be made that this show would not exist if it wasn't for Michael Brooks. <laughs> right. um, you know, he was kind of the guy who pushed me to the left. You know, yeah. I mean, it was, I got out of the sort of rad lib shit and I left the sort of IDW nonsense and the Dave Rubin crap behind. And it was because of Michael Brooks's incredibly insightful and empathetic and searing takedowns of people like Sam Harris and Dave Rubin right. and Jordan Peterson. And, and obviously I had never really been a Jordan Peterson fan. I always thought he sucked, but like, <laughs> but like, you know, he, Michael Brooks expanded my mind to ideas that I didn't know anything about, you know, whether right. I was learning about pan-African socialism, you know, the history of Marxism, all of it, it, you know, it was me learning from, you know, him and Dave Griscom and Matt Leck and, and their, sh the Michael Brooks show was, in my opinion, the best left talk show going. I mean, I don't think anybody did it better than, than Michael Brooks did. No offense to you, my friend, but, you know, <laughs> but, but nobody, no. nobody did it better than him. And I think three years on, I, I feel like his, his presence is, his absence is so felt. I feel like we're living in an age where we don't have that kind of warm and compassionate cosmopolitan socialist voice. Right. Um, and so I think that if our show can add to that and sort of, you know, keep the legacy of what he was doing alive, I think we're, we're going to be on the right track. Um, I just think he was an extraordinary person and sure. so kind and so warm. Um, I didn't, he, we weren't friends. I didn't know him personally, but you know, I had met, messaged him on social media and I'd become a patron of the show. And he, he had messaged me personally, thanking me for becoming a patron. And, and he was just an incredible human being. And I, I just, I, it sucks. Like it's like, there was nothing I enjoyed more than like, you know, I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday nights. So I can't remember when they would record where Michael Brooks show. And it's like, oh, good. Like, that's going to be a good night. And like the highlight of your week. <laughs> it was always the highlight of my week, generally. Yeah. Like, you know, especially when I was working at the state archives, because I didn't love that job. So it was in the mornings listening to Michael Brooks made it made it better. Yeah. And it was really fun because I started listening to TMBS when I was still listening to Sam Harris. And then over time... <laughs> I was listening to more TMBS and I dropped Sam Harris. Yeah, and that's right. So as one the, would. <laughs> as one would and should. Um, yeah, that's right. So, you know, for those of you who um, are not as acquainted with Michael, Michael Brooks, just search him on YouTube. There's excellent lectures he's given, his TMBS, The Michael Brooks Show. Yeah. The Michael Brooks, I think it's called The Michael Brooks Legacy Project, is rebroadcasting a lot of the episodes. Nice. Um, because some of the stuff is topical, but some of the stuff he did was really evergreen and stuff that will always be relevant. Um, and, uh, and then I would highly encourage people to read his book against the web, which was his critique of Sam Harris and the intellectual dark web. Um, I don't think anybody really tackled that issue better than he did. Um, right. and I wrote a review of that book for my blog. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, um, you know, it's life is such a gift. And I think that every day, um, we should look at life as a gift, despite the, the problems we may deal with or the, the, ad, the adversities we may experience. Yeah. Um, but you know, losing, losing Michael he, Brooks is just such a, just feels like such a chasm. And, and I hope that, I hope that, um, you know, he was, he was like, I'm telling you, man, he was like the velvet underground. Maybe not everybody listened to Michael Brooks, but right. everybody who did like started their own show or were writing or doing other things. You know, there's so many people right. who he had on as guests who have their own shows now, like Ben Burgess or, yeah. um, or Daniel Bessner or, you know, uh, 
Like, there's so many. Yeah, it's like you say, like he's not maybe maybe not your fi- favorite artist, but he's your favorite artist. Artist, favorite artist, favorite artist. exactly. <laughs> um, which is not to discount his popularity. He was immensely popular, and the other thing that he was was he was in, immensely funny, so right. funny. And I think like the left, like I'm not good at this because I'm not the funniest person on the planet, but like the left needs to embrace warmth and joy and laughter, like all of those things that are really part core of the human experience. We can't just be sad and angry all the time. (laughs) And like Michael Brooks was so good at balancing when to be serious. I grew up, I'm Gen X, so obviously I'm out. (laughs) Sad and angry is the only thing I know how to do. (laughs) Um, And uh, yeah, um, and I'm a, I'm sort of a middle of the road millennial in the sense that like I'm going to smile even in the face of sheer terror. <laughs> but um, but yeah, no, I think that uh, yeah, he was incredible and he was able to be so funny and so incisive and so interesting all of the time. Um, if you want to see one of his funniest moments, I highly recommend when right before he passed. He did an episode of the Majority Report because he hosted the Majority Report on Thursdays. And so um, when Bolsonaro got COVID, <laughs> they did they did a whole little thing where they played Celebration by Cool the Gang and they nice. were all laughing and dancing. <laughs> it's pretty good. Obviously, his like weird caricatures were fun, like right wing Mandela. In Santorum's mind, Mandela comes out and he's like, of all of the injustices in the world, that could remind me of the struggle against apartheid. The delivery of health care <laughs> through a private market mechanism. <laughs> None could face the same level of injustice and tyranny <laughs> that Americans face by having an inconvenient website. And Nation of Islam Obama. Look, some people think that we only need to uh, target suicide bombings at Shia. Other people think that Sunnis who aren't on the righteous path should be a victim of suicide bombings as well. But look, we can all agree that we need to have more suicide bombings. We can all get together behind a common goal of restoring the caliphate. And if we don't listen to each other, then the infidels and the great Satan are going to beat us. And so, so many of those were great. Um, but yeah, I, I will miss him. I miss him terribly. And, and I think that, um, my hope is that with what we do here at Red Reviews and what we do with the skeptical leftists keeps the spirit and the sort of guiding ethos of what he was, what he was all about. I don't, the, the thing I know, like I wasn't, I, I'm one of the people that didn't really watch, uh, Michael Brooks. But my favorite people all watched my Michael Brooks. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So was- like uh, my my main exposure to him was when he was on uh, uh, Ina Nice Mango's show. Oh uh, yes, Play Conversations, which is, uh, I mean, I'm still a big fan of her show. So yeah, her show's excellent, and yes, her his appearances were great. Um, I just think that yeah, he was just such a blast to watch, and like like yeah, never had more fun listening to a show than when I was listening to TMBS. And, um, and so I just, I want to thank everybody who kind of keeps his spirit alive from his sister, who I think helps run the legacy project to Ben Burgess, to Matt Leck and David Griscom, who do their own show now called left reckoning, which is pretty good. And, um, and everybody who is, you know, I feel like we, I, I know I owe him a debt and, and I know that, that he was so good at being a, a really great expositor of ideas and making them interesting, but making them accessible while not dumbing them down or patronizing right. the audience or condescending. He was really good at being warm and welcoming. And I hope that we do that with our show too. Yep. I agree. Yeah. So anyway, love you, Michael Brooks. Miss you, man. You are the best left is best. Um, so with that in mind, let's get started. Sure. So we are in the midst of the very first of the first SAG-AFTRA WGA strike in oh. 63 years. Yeah. So the writer's strike and the, um, the actor's strike, they have not struck since, together since 1960. 
Wow. It's a very big deal. Um, Hollywood is essentially shut down. And what are they, what are they striking over? They're really striking over the ways in which these big media companies continue to exploit actors and writers and directors um, yeah. and not providing them the space and the creativity and quite frankly, the compensation that they deserve, right? Yeah. And the reason that they've been able to sort of um, have such a stranglehold on the industry is because of its consolidation, because of its um, monopoly or oligopoly nature. And I don't think there's any any better book right now in the current zeitgeist that kind of deals with how we got to this place right. better than the book we're going to be talking about tonight, which is um, Choke Point Capitalism um, by Rebecca Giblin and Cory Doctorow. Um, Rebecca Giblin is a lawyer um, who specializes in sort of entertainment law and antitrust law. And then Cory Doctorow is, I mean, he's Cory Doctorow, um, <laughs> uh, uh, incredible science fiction author, novelist, activist, yeah. um, and who has written, I think, extremely eloquently on the issues concerning capitalism, big tech, and media. Um, I always say when people are asking me, you know, how do you want to learn about capitalism and the media? I always give them three people to check out. One is Bob McChesney, Robert McChesney, okay. who's pioneering work is incredible on studying the relationship between media conglomeration and corporate consolidation and the degradation of media and journalism. Um, and just as a side note, he was the last guest on the Michael Brooks show before Michael oh. passed. Um, and two is Michael Parenti and, and inventing reality, which we've talked about in a previous episode. Yep. And three is Cory Doctorow. Um, I think what McChesney and Parenti do for print and television and radio Doctor O does for like the internet and streaming and understanding the sort of media landscape. Right. He's got a terrific book that I highly recommend people check out. I think it's called information doesn't want to be free, which is all about copyright law and the ways in which copyright law constricts creativity and actually doesn't help artists. It actually harms them more than helps. Right. Um, the audio book of that is terrific. It's narrated by Will Wheaton. Uh, I'm a big Will Wheaton fan. So he narrates it, nice. um, which is awesome. Uh, um, oh, um, I guess this is a good point to mention. Yeah. Uh, on Audible, there is yeah. only one thing by Cory Doctorow, and it's titled, Why None of My Books Are on Audible. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. And I listened to the audiobook of this book through Libby, through my public library. Oh, so yeah. I, didn't yep. use, I don't use Audible at all. Um, Audible kind of sucks. And we'll yeah. get into why Audible sucks. <laughs> um, but yeah. So um, – so yeah, so why is the book called Choke Point Capitalism? In our previous episode this week, I talked about how I sometimes don't like when authors or thinkers sort of put qualifiers on on the term capitalism. Right. I was critical of Bernie Sanders doing it, calling it like uber capitalism. It's like, no, right. bro, it's just capitalism. But in the case of this book, it actually serves a very specific purpose. There's right. a methodology behind why they're saying it this way, which is that we live in an age of extreme corporate consolidation. You know, about 90% of what, uh, of any kind of media that you consume, print, media, music, um, television, radio, film, is controlled by a very small handful of companies. It's like five, five or six. Right. The vast majority yeah. of what you watch, listen to, or read is coming from about, you know, the, the, uh, the same number of corp corporations you can count on maybe one or two hands. That's yep. it. And, and so how did we get to this point? So what does choke point capitalism mean? So what they talk about is that these industries consolidate and then they create choke points within the system itself to basically, um, it to extract rents as like, um, Adam Smith or Marx would call it. Right. So it's all about rent seeking. So for example, um, with, Choke points. Think about Ticketmaster. Ticketmaster is a great example. They have a good chapter in the book about Ticketmaster. Ticketmaster and Live Nation. So Ticketmaster is the largest ticketing uh, ticketing company in the United States, and Live Nation is the largest venue company in the United States, um, and 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 producer of live events in the United States. Those two companies are merged. So Live Nation and Ticketmaster are one company, right? Right. And in any reasonable world that they they wouldn't be right yeah 
And That's literally a monopoly. <laughs> it's literally a monopoly. Um, and where they control the vast, the vast majority of um, concerts and any other live events in the United States. Um, and think about all of the fees. Like if you've gone to a concert or you've gone to a live event or something like that, you see all these fees that are tacked on to your, your tickets. This is a choke point. They've created a choke point because they're the only people who are ticketing the event and they're the only people who are producing the event and they're the only people who own the venue. So you have to go through them and they know that. So they use that to their advantage by building in these pressure points within the system, whether it be extern external fees or extracting more out of artists instead of paying them more fairly. Right. right? Um, those are the choke points um, in uh, let's say, for example, in uh, film, you know, Disney is an enormous corporation, right? Um, and over the last year to, to the last few years, we've seen um, serious media mergers that I think have been absolutely detrimental to the media industry and to the consumer. Um, one was the merger of um, Warner Brothers and Discovery which happened fairly recently, um, which was hot off of the heels of the Warner Brothers AT&T merger, which happened before that. Right. Um, again, companies that have no business being able to buy each other can. Right. Um, and same with Disney. So Disney owns Marvel. Disney owns Lucasfilm, which is Star Wars and Indiana Jones and all that stuff. Um, Disney owns ESPN. Um, D Disney owns ABC. Disney owns Hulu. They have a majority stake in Hulu, the okay. streaming platform. Um, Di and Disney owns, tw now owns 20th Century Fox or 20th Century, oh, 21st Century Fox. Right. Um, so the Disney Fox merger, which I think was finalized either last year or the year before, was a major media merger. And with all of these mergers, any movie that you go and see in the theaters, 40% of all box office in film and going and seeing films in the theater is controlled by Disney. Um, so, you know, <laughs> that's insane. So of every 10 movies that you see, four of them are probably going to be by Disney. Yeah. Um, and the other, the, and then the other six are probably likely going to be Sony because they own Columbia pictures, right? Warner brothers, which is yeah. Warner brothers discovery universal, which is owned by Comcast. Um, or, uh, let's see, or Paramount, right. um, whose parent company is CBS Viacom, whose then parent company is a company called General Amusements. Okay. So you have all of these different companies. So there's, there's, and they call this vertical integration. There's vertical integration and horizontal integration. Vertical integration is when a bunch of different firms co combine together to serve different points within the media ecosystem. Wow. And then, and then horizontal integration is then the delivery system, how they provide that to consumers. Um, so to back to the live nation example, that was a long winded <laughs> explanation to get back to talking about Ticketmaster or live nation, um, is with mo with Ticketmaster, we've actually, I, we talked about that when we talk about movies. Mm. Um, so again, the reason why film going to the movies is so expensive is because the studios are heavily consolidated. The movie theater chains are heavily consolidated. Right. The vast majority of movie theaters in the United States are either owned by AMC, um, uh, Re Regal or Lowe's or one other ones. Like it's right. very consolidated. Um, and so again, those are extra choke points so they can charge you fees. So yeah. for example, my wife and I are going to go see Oppenheimer on Sunday. Okay. And we bought the tickets online and they charged us a convenience fee. <laughs> Even though it costs them less for me to do it through the website than it is for me to do it with a person, I'm paying Funny. for the privilege of yeah. doing it through a website. Again, it used to be like they wanted you to do it online so they would give you a discount mm -hmm. online. But now it's like, now, no, now nope. it's too convenient for You're you. You're paying for the privilege. More. You're paying for the convenience of yeah. it. So these are choke points for consumers, but there's also choke points for producers because for us as a consumer, we deal with monopolies or oligopolies, which is you know industries that are either controlled by one company or industries that are only controlled by a handful of companies. But on the other end of it, if you're somebody interested in selling content, you have to deal with the fact that these companies are monopsonies. 
Okay. Um, so that's a very different term. So monopolies is when you have um, you have either one company or a handful of companies selling things. And then monopsities is when you either have one company or a handful of companies buying things. Interesting. So, for example, with Amazon is a good example of this. And Amazon plays a huge role in the book. With Amazon, um, Amazon started as a book company, like yep. as, a book, as a book retail company. That was its goal. And their goal was basically to um, buy books, sell them as close to cost as possible, kill a lot of the competition. And then once the competition was killed, jack the prices back up. Of course. Which is objectively what they did. Um, and the goal is to create what they call moats. So it's creating an industry where you, pu you push out and force out so many people, both on the selling end of it and on the buying end of it, that you essentially have a fortified position within the economy. Right. Now you can't be moved. You're, you're, you can't be moved. You're stuck. Uh, you're permanent. You can't, you know, and Amazon pretty much has that moat and it's been in that position for years. Most people don't realize that Amazon didn't really generate a profit for many, many years. Yeah. You know, um, its goal was growth. So a good example of how they became a monopsony was there was a website called diapers.com. Right. Very, very simple. They were a online retailer of diapers and they were, they were cheaper than Amazon and they were more effective than Amazon. What Amazon did was in order to compete with them, they basically decided to sell diapers to the exact same products that diapers.com was selling, but at either, a loss. At, either at cost or at a loss. Yeah. And overnight, they killed the diapers.com business. And then when it was on its last leg, they bought it. Right. So because that's they could get it for a song, right? They could get it for a song because they had killed the industry, right? This is how Amazon is a monopoly and a monopsony. So when if you're somebody who wants to sell something on Amazon, you have to play by their rules. Yeah. You don't get to set the terms. You have to live with what they want. A good example of this is there's a small independent publishing company called Melville House. Okay. And Melville House wanted... Um, Amazon was instituting a new sort of fee system where you had to kick back so much to Amazon for every book you sold. Okay. And Melville House was like, well, we can't make that work. You know, our business model will not allow for this. Um, right. with you want these ex such exorbitant, exorbitant fees. We can't, we can't reasonably be in business with this, but they also can't reasonably be without Amazon's business. Right. Because Amazon accounted for about 10% of its overall revenue. Oh, 10 to 20 percent so if they killed amazon if they killed off their connection to amazon they killed off their connection they killed off the company right that's, and so, that's a big revenue stream to lose and so when you only have a few sellers in the market or a few buyers in the market that you can sell to you don't have that much choice in how your products end up getting to consumers you right. have to live on their terms um and audible is the same way uh, Audible was a company. That's the other thing about Silicon Valley that's really important is that most Silicon Valley companies, the big ones like Google, yeah. Apple, Facebook, Meta, whatever, whatever. Um, <laughs> um, fuck you, Zuck. Am, fuck you, Zuck. Yeah. Although this this year is, is this year is weird. It's got me rooting for Zuck. <laughs> I, That's just because Elon Musk, Musk is such I a piece of shit. Elon Musk so much. He's <laughs> such a scumbag. Um, and so, uh, so where was I at? Oh, so like with with um, these companies, they're really good at honestly a few things. Chances are most of these companies get really good at like one thing, and that one thing enables them to grow and be incredibly successful and wealthy. And then using their wealth, instead of sort of innovating and coming up with new creative products, right. they either copy them in the case of like threads or Instagram stories, which basically copied uh, Snapchat, yep. or they buy out companies in the case of like Instagram. Instagram was an independent company. Facebook bought Instagram. Yep. Facebook bought WhatsApp. Um, uh, Amazon bought uh Kindle, or not Kindle, Amazon bought um, Audible. Audible was an independent company. Right. Amazon bought them. Amazon bought diapers.com. Amazon bought Goodreads. Like anything, like so. Oh, that sucks, actually. I didn't know that. Amazon owns <laughs> I Goodreads. Good, yeah. Goodreads. Well, here's the thing, though. 
since Amazon bought Goodreads, the app has gone to shit. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's, it sucks. They basically bought it and they do nothing with it. But because they know you're not going to use anything else, because again, it's a monopoly. You, they yeah. know there's, there's a very good shot that that, the, there's no other book app that's, that book, like reading tracking app that will do what Goodreads does for you. Yeah. So they know that and they play on that. That's another choke point, right? You have to go through them. Or with Audible, it's like you have to go through them. Um, and, uh, and so they have really bad, generally they have pretty crummy terms for, um, for the producers of content. So does Spotify. Spotify is another example of this where they have yeah. pretty crummy terms for artists. Artists make almost very little money. People think that when you listen to an artist on Amazon, all of the, the revenue from listening to those songs goes directly to that artist. And that's yeah, not necessarily no. the case. There's a lot of back, there's a lot of sort of back end deals that artists have like Drake and Taylor Swift and other artists who they're going to get a chunk of revenue from all streams on Spotify before right. the artist you listen to actually gets it. Yeah. So that's why for the vast majority of like sort of smaller independent artists, they're not going to make any real money on, on um, Spotify. And they see, and they use the same logic for Spotify that they do for broadcast radio, which is on broadcast radio, the radio stations do not have to do not have to pay a licensing fee to the artist or to the label for playing the music on the radio in the United States. They don't have to pay for it. Okay. Um, except for Sirius satellite radio, you do, but AM or FM broadcast radio that's on public airwaves that are regulated by the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, you don't have to pay any money for it. That's interesting. And the and the argument that they use is, well, it's free advertising for you. Because back in the day, if you heard the song on the radio, there's a good shot you would have bought the 45 single, you'd have bought the record, you bought the CD. I suppose. I suppose, right? Well, obviously, about 20 years ago, that industry cratered. So then, yeah. um, so then downloads became a thing, and now it's streaming, right? And, and they say, well, it's still free advertising because people will go and see your concerts. Right. But, th but then COVID happened, and that basically killed – the live entertainment industry overnight yeah. and artists still had to, to live with the consequences of that because of corporate consolidation. Yeah. So those are all of the effects of what we're dealing with, right? As consumers, we have far less choice. There's yeah. far less competition leading to crummier outcomes, higher costs and lower quality products. And the other thing is all of this is backed up by intellectual property law, copyright. Yeah. yeah. And, Copyright's whole intention from the beginning was to provide artists and creators with exclusive rights to copy and disseminate their material. But the problem is, is that many artists don't even own the copyright to their material. Yep. And so it, copyright has become in many ways a bludgeon by which big media companies get what they want in the marketplace, not just against consumers, but against producers um, and sellers of content. I often think of... Uh... Like, uh, oh, the one artist who uh, was raped by her producer, and oh, he Kesha. owned all the right. Yeah, he owned yeah. all the rights to everything. So yep. she just didn't produce music for like a decade. <laughs> yeah. Or think about what's going on with Taylor Swift right now. Right. So she's re she's re recording all of her songs so that she can own those masters. Right. And do with them what she will. Um. Taylor Swift actually probably has one of the better music deals in all of music, not just in recent memory, but kind of for all time. Like her, her impact on the industry is so large right? and she generates so much revenue for the, for, for the label that they kind of give her what she wants, but she had to work really hard to get there. And for the vast majority of her career, she owned nothing, Yeah, which is usually how it goes. So most people don't realize that Paul McCartney doesn't own a lot of the Beatles catalog. Right. None yeah. of the Beatles did. For a well, long for a time. While, didn't Michael Jackson own them? Michael Jackson did own them. And so Michael <laughs> I Jackson that being bought a big them. deal. <laughs> Michael Jackson bought the, the 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 masters of the Beatles. Then when Michael Jackson died, his estate split it between half of it still being owned by the Michael Jackson estate and the other half being sold to Sony. Okay. So Sony owns half of it now and and whatnot. So um, and so artists have less control today than they probably, in some respects, they have more control today because of the internet and the, the ability of like having like right. sites like Bandcamp and, and Deezer and other sort of streaming or downloading sites that provide 
much better terms to artists. But again, they are a very small part of a very large media ecosystem. You have to be like, like for musicians, it's almost like they have to act like podcasters where yep. you just, you make a thing, expect nothing from it and just put it everywhere and hopefully get some money back. And hope that there's an, or, you know, some bands have even done Patreon. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. So lots for example, of bands. Uh, you know, I guess the big kind of music media story this week is the breakup of Anti-Flag. Oh, so yeah. Anti-Flag, can... Anti-Flag broke up. Yeah. Because um, that and, dude's a rapist, right? <laughs> well, I have no idea what, what the, what <laughs> the what short and long of it is. All I know is that I need to look more into it. But the reason I bring it up is um, because they had a Patreon. Oh, so, you know, they had a Patreon. So it was, um, uh, so that was a way of them to be able to connect with their, with their audience and fans and they shut their Patreon down. Um, no, I didn't know about that. Yeah, part. I, I heard was like, that. that's what I, was I heard. Like, anyway. Why, why are they <laughs> closing up so abruptly? You yeah. know, there was a big scandal with another punk band of that generation, the casualties. That was another band where okay. the lead singer was accused of, of, um, sexual misconduct with, with people. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, um, it's kind of a scourge in the industry. Um, and I don't really know how we effectively do with that beyond obviously like, you know, creating a better society and, and raising, <laughs> right. people, raising young men to be better. And like yeah. all of those things are good, but there's also structural reasons for that. And it's questions of power and, and the way power relations are and everything like that. Um, but long story short, um, to get us all to, how in the how in the world did we end up in this hellscape? How did this happen? Well, it happened because there was a radical redefinition of antitrust law. Ah. So for those who don't know, antitrust is basically starting in the in the late 19th century in the United States, there were these big, huge corporations that controlled vast swaths of the industry, like Standard Oil, um, U.S. Steel or Carnegie Seal, and so on. They were called the trusts. They were set up as the trusts. And starting in the 1890s with the Sherman Antitrust Act, the Clay- and then later on the Clayton Antitrust Act, um, and the presidency of Theodore Roosevelt and the Progressive Era, antitrust law was enforced. And for, for a good chunk of the late 19th and early 20th century, for most of the 20th century, antitrust law was enforced. Companies could not grow too big because it harms competition and actually right. goes against the uh, a healthy or what legal theorists, particularly liberals, think is a healthy um, mode of capitalism that actually right. creates innovation, that actually has competition and so on. Because I keep trying to tell this to people. Capitalism is not about markets and capitalism is not about competition. It's just not. Right. Capitalism is the absence of competition. It is the absence of markets. Capitalism is solely the private ownership of the means of production and the generation of surplus value, a.k.a. Yep. profit. That unless, is capitalism. Yeah, unless, unless you specifically make rules against it happening, it will always funnel up to the It top. always funnel up. Yep. And it not only does it always funnel up, it also concentrates. It concentrates as it funnels up. Yep. Um, it's the cartelization, which um, capitalism, uh, some random geek says, Capitalism is about power. Absolutely. It's about power, but specifically, you know, it's about power, but how power is manifested through a specific means of production. You know, that's the, I mean, that's the Marxist theoretical framework I'm working with here. Right. But to broaden it out, it is about power, right? So the way that we got here was there was a judge, very influential lawyer judge who almost was on the U.S. Supreme Court, a guy named Robert Bork. Okay. And Robert Bork, um, the name sounds you know, familiar. Another, <laughs> another one of the villains of American history. <laughs> um, yeah. Robert Bork was um, had basically started to radically re reconceptualize antitrust law, and so that sort of developed into the Bork Rule or the Bork Standard, where um, so long as cons- corporate consolidation as long as corporate consolidation did not harm consumers, right, it was okay. Yeah, that's the standard that the Canadian government seems to use. Like, yep, and that's the Bork rule. That all comes from Robert Bork. Yeah. It's it's, I mean, probably obviously other people, but he's going to be the avatar for this. You know, if you know, choke point capitalism was kind of created by Robert Bork. 
shareholder capitalism, where the only thing people care about are the shareholders and nobody else, was pretty much created by Milton Friedman. Right. So, you know, these two men have had an immense harm on our society. No shit. Um, and just look up Milton Friedman Chile and you'll you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Yep. Um, but that's a whole other discussion. Or uh, uh, <laughs> Read the Shock Doctrine by Read Milton the Shock Doctrine. Yeah. If you want to know any more about how awful and horrible um, Milton Friedman is, check out the Shock Doctrine. So the Bork rule or the Bork standard has become, ah, Milton, yeah, some random geek says, ah, Milton Friedman, the war criminal. Absolutely. War criminal, supreme sociopath. <laughs> yeah. Uh, absolutely a sociopath. So, um, so the Bork rule became pretty standard. And so for much starting really in the 1970s, but very much going into the 80s and 90s, obviously with the age of neoliberalism, um, antitrust law just generally wasn't enforced. Not really. Um, the only two major antitrust cases that have happened within the last you know, 30, 40 years was the breakup of AT&T or Ma Bell, which happened in the 1980s and Microsoft in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and basically for its monopoly on web browsers, um, which is, uh, and, you know, Bill Gates being on, on television every night in depositions looking like a complete fucking asshole. Right. Which is why he spent the last 20 something years not look, trying not to look like an asshole. Um, and so, um, so that's pro, that's really the problem is that we have a very pro corporate interpretation of antitrust law. But as Giblin and Dr. O note, that is starting to change. Um, okay. There are some people who are now at the U.S. Justice Department and the uh, the um, the SEC Security Exchange Commission, um, but specifically the Antitrust Department of the uh, Division of the Justice Department, and they're called the New Brandeisians. Okay. Um, and there are a whole group of people who are working to actively try to force the system into um, enforcing antitrust, like seriously enforcing antitrust. Um, and unfortunately, I think that some of, unfortunately, their successes have not been as large as I would have wanted. Would have wanted. For example, um, as you may have heard recently in the news, there's likely going to be a merger between Microsoft and Blizzard Activision, right. um, the big game developer. Um, in any normal understanding of antitrust, this would never, ever happen. Right. Um, and it may still not happen based on European regulators, but... But, you know, but yeah, I mean, so there are some people really at, at higher levels of power who are genuinely trying to change the culture. Um, and the reason they're called the new Brandeisians is they're named after Louis Brandeis, the former Supreme Court justice, um, who was a stern proponent of antitrust and often ruled in antitrust favor when, when a Supreme Court justice. Um, and he has one of the best quotes ever, which is, you can either have a democracy or wealth concentrated in the handful of individuals. You cannot have both. <laughs> um, and he's right. Yep. He's ultimately right. Yep. So the kind of things that we've seen in antitrust are industry wide in terms of the media, but also in terms of pretty much anything, right? You know, the defense industry is a handful of, of companies. The oil industry is a handful of companies. The food industry yep. is a handful of companies. Like it's all these mega corporations that have an incredible amount of influence and power yep. over the economy and over American or global society and global politics. And so we, first off, we do genuinely need better antitrust enforcement. I think, um, you know, and, and, um, and how do we get there? I mean, what is, what's our future? What are the solutions? Um, Giblin and Dr. O lay out a lot of them. So one of them is break them up. So back in the days, you know, when Teddy Roosevelt was the trust buster or breaking up AT&T or Ma Bell in the 1970s and eighties, um, that's what we need to do with Amazon. Amazon needs yeah. to be broken up. Um, Amazon Web Services needs to be its own company. Audible needs to be its own company. Um, Goodreads needs to be its own company. Um, Abe Books, which is also owned by Amazon, needs to be its own company. Yeah. Um, with with Facebook, Facebook needs to be its own company. Or or um, the Metaverse needs to be its own company. Instagram right. needs to be its own company. Break them up. Yeah. Same with Google. Um, you know, break up because the global, you know, Apple is the same way because they own a tremendous amount. Right. Break these companies up because it's going to be one of the only ways. But as we on the left know, who are more radical than 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 sort of progressive liberals, um, antitrust is not enough. No, you have to go farther. And the way that you go farther is by a radical reshifting of basic premises on how we structure the economy. 
Um, one of them that I think is really interesting in the book is something called um, radical interoperability. Okay. It's a really interesting term. So basically what it means is if you have, if you have an iPhone like I do, you can only download apps through the app store. You can't get them anywhere else, right? It only has a certain type of charger. It only has a certain type of device that I can use for certain things. Radical interoperability is the idea that I should be able to download the Google Play Store on my iPhone. Right. I should be able to use any cord I want. I should be able to use any device I want. I should be able to go into my device and change what I want, to repair what I want. And I did that um, with my uh, my Amazon tablet. I had to yeah. I had to do like some kind of I don't know what the hell. I downloaded a thing that said I could it could use Google devices now. It could act as an yep. Android. And you have because basically there's all these things are digital locks. Right. This is a term that Doctor O uses a lot. Digital locks, like so, um, like uh, our oh, what is it called DRM. Um, which is digital rights management. DRM is basically where you can't copy a book, where you can't copy a song, where you right. can't transfer it to a different device. Radical interoperability it uh, gives consumers more choice over how they use their devices yeah. um, and gives them more ownership. Because, um, And the way that we get radical interoperability is through um, right to repair laws. Right. So a lot of times there are things as varied as iPhones or even John Deere farm equipment. Um, oh, some random geek says all gamers hate DMR. Yeah, I would imagine those two, <laughs> right? Because yeah. again, it doesn't allow you to do certain things. You have to do things certain ways. Um, or if you don't, you break a warranty or you fuck up your device. Like there's all kinds of things that if you try to jailbreak it or you try to do something with it, you can't. We were talking and, about, yeah. uh, uh, you mentioned that you just got, uh, a copy of radicalized by Corey yeah. Doctorow. And yeah. there's, a, there's one of those, uh, one of the chapters or little short stories in that book is about like toasters that have, <laughs> that are digitally locked in that way. Yep. It, it's a, it's a brilliant little short story. And there are ways in which companies are now doing things with um, digital locks that um, I think are really pernicious. So for example, BMW, this is a couple of years ago. We're going to start instituting a program where if you had heated seats in your car, right, you had to pay a monthly fee to have heated seats in your yeah. car. And if you didn't pay your monthly subscription, the seats wouldn't heat up. Yeah, like go Next, fuck yourself. First off, go <laughs> fuck. second off, this is the very definition of rent seeking. This is yeah. exactly it's creating a choke point in the system in order to extract rent from somebody, even though they've already bought the fucking car. Yeah, you yeah. Um, I mean, I want to play 1994 Doom on my John Deere track. Exactly. Fuck yeah. That's, that's right. What, that's, that's radical <laughs> interoperability. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Yeah, that's, that is, that's it, right? And so I've always had this idea of, because I'm a huge, you know, New Deal nerd. I love learning about the New Deal and FDR and that whole era and sort of organizations like the Works Progress Administration and the Agricultural Adjustment Association and the National Recovery Association, all these different alphabet soup of agencies that were doing all these things around the country, whether it was putting on plays or recording um, former slave testimonies or um, doing paintings in post offices or building post offices or building libraries like the Indiana State Library is a WPA building where I work. It's right. a WPA building built in the 1930s. I have this like idea in my head, like if I was king for a day, you know, I would do this where we would set up what I call the Federal Bureau of Repairs and Replacements. It's a <laughs> nice. division where let's say that your, your toaster craps out and you don't want to go and buy a new one. Someone will come to your house and they will fix your toaster for free. There you go. Um, yeah. it's, it's part of being a citizen that, that, you know, you pay your taxes and your taxes go towards paying somebody to come into your home and fix your stuff. Yep. Um, and, uh, or if you need to replace it, you can go to a federal bureau like repository and either get something for free or near free instead of right. having to go into other places, trade in your old one that sucks your old and, stuff and, yeah. and get something new or sell off for parts, you know, kind of like how you go to like a used bookstore and you sell books back and you get like credit. You can yep. do the same thing with toasters. You can do the same thing with, with electronics. You know, think of all the things that go into electronics that once you throw a phone away, there's a lot of really good stuff in it. There's gold, yeah. there's cadmium, there's 
you know, there's, um, there's lithium, there's platinum, there's gold, there's all these different things. I think I said gold twice, but like, <laughs> there's all these different things that could, could be used in other devices, right? Sure. And could reconfiction, but capitalism doesn't allow for that because it doesn't generate profits, right? right? Yeah. You know, the, the built like radical interoperability is anathema to the, how the system is structured, which is built in obsolescence. Yeah. They want you to have to go get the new phone. You know, yep. they want you to do that. Um, and, and there's all kinds of things that they do. Like, for example, like starting with certain iPhones, there's no longer a headphone jack. You right. have to use the, the lightning pin jack. And then eventually they're going to do away with the lightning pin jack altogether and replace it with a USB-C port because the European agencies told Apple, you have to put USB, USB-C ports on your phones. Yeah. And instead of Apple going, well, we'll just do that for Europe. They'll, they're going to do it for everybody. Yep. Um, yeah, some yeah. random geek says, remember TV and VCR repair shops? Those are gone. Yes. You know, why repair the old TV when you get the new plasma HD TV? Exactly, <laughs> right. right? This yeah. is the issue, right? And so um, I think that we live in a very throwaway culture where people yeah. are very comfortable because, and honestly, like we've all done it, right? Like we, we've got yep. holes in socks and we throw them away or we get a broken phone and we throw it away. Like we all do that because- we don't, we're not incentivized to do anything else. There isn't that federal bureau of repairs and replacements that does yeah. those kinds of things for you. And I just think like the idea of radical interoperability is such a cool idea. And it just goes into my vision of the world, which is that why do we keep constantly producing shit we don't need yep. and throw away stuff that we do like clothing and food and, and, um, and vehicles and electronics. Yeah, like yeah. you, you could potentially. Like, I don't know what the lifespan of cobalt is, mm -hmm. but why are we mining cobalt so much when we have so many discarded phones and, yes. you know, like we probably could limit the amount of cobalt that's being mined. <laughs> why isn't there a universal jobs program where we are training people to remove these elements <laughs> from phones? <laughs> some random geek says wait you throw a socks with holes in them i have sailor moon shoes <laughs> um yeah i do i i wear my socks out pretty badly because i i walk hard so it's um i buy the cheap socks so yep. then uh so then i buy a bag of 20 pairs of socks for 10 bucks mm -hmm. when they get a hole in them i throw them out that's yeah. it <laughs> and that's the thing right is like we live in an era where consumer products are immensely cheap because um, that's made with cheap labor and cheap materials. And so, um, you know, like people can still have stuff, you know, my grandmother still had, you know, kitchen appliances, you know, from the fifties or her, her sewing machine that she used her entire life. She got as like a girl in the right. 1950s and she had it her entire life and it still works. Right. Like we don't have pro and like, we should have that sense of like durability. There's not really durability anymore because there's no money in it. The old folks uh, used to always say it, like nothing's built to last anymore. All the good no, old days when everything was really. built to last. I mean, it's some like, things are built no. better today than they were in the sense that like right. we make products that don't have fucking lead in them. Yeah. Um, or yeah. asbestos. That's always or good. Or mercury. Like those are good. Like, <laughs> yeah. like having really heavy metals that are dangerous to people, not having them in stuff is good. And I don't mind being able to move my television myself. <laughs> yes. Like, yeah. I mean, think about it. I mean, televisions used to be fucking furniture. Yeah. You know, my grandma's TV, fucking wood cabinet. <laughs> fucking, like, wood cabinet. My grandmother had a Quasar TV uh, for most of my childhood. And it was this big Hulkin motherfucker. It yep. had speakers built into it. And, and it was all wooden and it was nice looking. That son of a bitch worked <laughs> forever. Yep. And it was, you know, I had a Zenith TV growing up that was one of the old tube TVs. It was huge. Right. Great fucking TV. Yep. Like it was a great TV. I mean, Zenith, I don't think are around. Zenith is a company that's not around anymore, but they used to make great TVs. Um, and now we live in an age where, you know, TVs are so dirt cheap and they're really light. Yep. You know, I have a 55 inch TV in my living room and it's, it was I just in a box and I was able to carry it down, you know, <laughs> down in an elevator. Like it was like, enough. <laughs> right. Like they don't, they weigh nothing. Yeah, that's right. Which is nice, right? But they like, just put a handle on the box and away you go. 
But but think about it. I mean, if we lived in a culture where we were having a federal jobs guarantee where we train people and we we created best practices to keep them safe from heavy metals and other other, you know, gave them good PPE and and, and but good jobs with good wages and good benefits that we could put people to work repairing devices, you know, recycling materials. Think of the benefit of climate like the benefit to the climate of oh, doing yeah. this kind of stuff, yeah, right? right? You know, I mean, th- I mean this is what I'm talking about. Like is it's we should become a society that cherishes um, the value of being able to replace stuff, to be able to mix things together the way we want to without somebody bargaining down our door and accusing us of violating intellectual property. (laughs) Right. Because I'm getting, I'm, this is where like, I am like radically like, I'm like big anarchist on this one. Like, (laughs) like copyright is bullshit. Yeah. Copyright is complete and utter bullshit. The, 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 the whole impetus behind copyright is to give the creators protection so that they can be able to monetize their work and be able to make a living off of it. But they can't. Yeah. They don't. Copyright is now a weapon that corporations use against the artists who make the work and against the consumers who enjoy the work. So yep. it's like, yeah, it's so no longer for, can't. like, it's not for artists. It's for rights holders, right? Mm hmm. And the rights holders don't even necessarily have to be the artist. Yeah, no. This is why Prince, they use this example in the book. This is why Prince in the 90s, like, put the word slave on his face right. and, like, got angry with Warner and changed his name to an unpronounceable symbol. And, you know, and the yeah. whole artist formula known as Prince stuff. And, like, for sure. Because he didn't have a lot of creative control over his work. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and so, you know, so what's another solution to this, which is that universal licenses that provide universal income to artists. This is another solution they have in the book where they reconfigure law. Um, some random geek says Disney will forever own Mickey Mouse. Absolutely. I'm going to do a quick tangent. We'll get back on track. I, do- <laughs> okay. I, in my day job, I digitize historic materials. I have to kind of know the ins and outs of copyright every single day. And one of the things is in the United States, um, anything before January 1st, 1928 is in the public domain, meaning anybody can use it for any purpose whatsoever. So technically, technically, Mickey Mouse, Mickey Mouse is in the public domain, but only a very specific version of him, right? Which is the Steamboat Willie version of, of course. Mickey Mouse is in the public domain. You can use that instance of Mickey Mouse however you want. But you can't use Mickey Mouse in general any way you want. But if you want to use the Steamboat Willie, you can. And in fact, as a fun gag, John Oliver did this on his show. Right. Um, and I forget was it was referenced to something, but he did do it. Um, and like made Mickey Mouse like a raunchy mascot or something. But, um, but if you want to know why copyright law sucks so bad, blame the mouse. It's because of Disney's outsized influence on the copyright intellectual property sphere. They, they changed the rules so that they will virtually own the Mickey Mouse copyright until the end of time, which is hilarious. This is absolutely hilarious because Disney, Walt Disney built his fucking empire on doing cartoons based on works in the public domain. Right. Yeah. This was a guy who built his entire thing upon work that he could just take and use however he wanted and now they can't it's like george lucas bitching about the colorization of film in the 1980s and then going and making the fucking special editions not allowing people to see the original versions of star wars (laughs) um yeah so like these are so so yes disney is like the evil behemoth that must be destroyed like i feel like if you can break up disney it's like it's like dominoes. I feel right. like if you, if you break up Disney, you break them all up. And but it's yeah, and they should be broken up. Yep. And uh, you know, or I mean, obviously, we're more radical. Put them under work <laughs> control. <you know? laughs> yeah, um, that's right. You know, get rid of Bob Iger and get rid of David Zaslov and get rid of the guy who runs NBC Universal and just get rid of all these people. They're worthless. Yep, it's amazing right. how. This is another quick aside, and then we'll get back on track. I always find how we structure CEO pay very strange to me. Right. So they can be good at their job and be paid a lot of money, or they can be terrible at their job and be paid a lot of money. Yeah. And they get paid a lot of money to go away. It's, right. it's interesting. In any Name any other job where you, if you're bad at it, they pay you money to leave. 
Nope. It's almost it's almost unheard of. Um, some random geek says solidarity with the actors and writers currently on strike. Absolutely. You bet. Absolutely. And they keep saying like, what should we do as consumers? Keep watching your shows. There's not a streaming or like consumption boycott yet. So like keep going to the movies, you know, keep, you know, in fact, that's a good thing because if people stop, then people say, oh, see the chilling effect of the, of the strikes. People aren't going <laughs> to the movies or people aren't going to watch TV. No, continue to watch stuff unless they explicitly say otherwise. But what you can do is um, look into, I forget what it's like, the entertainment fund where, you know, there's a general fund that you can pay into. It's like a mutual aid for those who are on strike so that they don't, you know. Um, and uh, so you can do that. You can obviously like share stuff on social media. You can write to your congressperson or senator or member of parliament um and say hey you know do the you know you should back the strikers um you know, the you know the biden yeah community yeah community entertainment fund. fund i think it's a dot org thanks some random geek yes that's absolutely right yes you know support support their strike fund um they're in it for the long haul and i hope they win i hope they get everything they want i want them to bend these ceos on I want them to bend them on a barrel. Like I, 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 you know, I just, because like David, like David Zaslav, who runs Warner brothers discovery is objectively bad at his job. Right. Like he's not very good at it. He's also a Trumper piece of shit. Ugh. So like, there's that too. Right. So under the leadership of David Zaslav, CNN was run into the ground under the, the leadership of Chris Licht, which Keith Olbermann used to joke that when he worked at MSNBC, everybody thought that Chris Licht ate paste. <laughs> um, the, the, the flash movie was a huge bomb. Black Adam was a huge bomb. Uh, Shazam was a huge bomb. This new Aquaman, Aquaman movie coming out. Apparently it's a real piece of shit too. It's been in post-production for 18 months and th three of sets course. of reshoots and test screenings. that are terrible. That movie's going to fucking bomb. The yeah. only movie that Warner brothers is going to put out this year. That's going to make any money is probably Barbie. That's the only right. one. Yeah. But like, just to give you guys a sense of how bad the flash did. And it's, this is not a commentary on like whether or not the movie's good. I don't know. Some of the clips I've seen online, it looks like dog shit. But I, I, all I can tell you is that movie is going to make less money in its theatrical <laughs> run. It's going to make less money in its theatrical run than Green Lantern did. The one that's like a big joke yep. that Ryan Reynolds is in that everybody, that everybody says, makes fun of. Yeah, yeah. Everybody makes fun of. That movie made more money in the theater than this Flash movie did. Yeah. Or, or, or is going to. Um, so. Clearly, David Zaslov is shit at his job. Like, he's objectively bad at it. Um, they were much, much better off canceling the Flash as a product, uh, as a project and having a tax write-off. They would have been much yeah. better off doing yeah. that. Um, and they might still do it with, uh, with Aquaman. We'll see what happens. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, the sunk cost fallacy. Yeah. I mean, keep blowing through the, through the, the house money. I mean, it doesn't Whatever, matter. Whatever. Yeah. Um, I just, the thing that I really hope for, and again, like it's all sucks that there's no ethical consumption or capitalism. So these are with many caveats, but, um, if Oppenheimer and Barbie do well, it will be a signal to the studios that we're tired of comic book bullshit. We are tired of sequels. Um, and, and they canceled the Batgirl movie. That's right. They did which cancel Batgirl actually movie, good, <laughs> which would have been good. And chances are would have generated a profit for them because that movie costs very little to make compared right. to the flash, which I think had like 250 to $300 million put into it. Yeah. It's amazing how much this movie costs and it looks so bad. Like it's remarkable to me. I'm like, what? Where did the money even go? Where did the money go? <laughs> you know, it was like, I remember when I saw the, the justice league in the theater, the, the shitty Joss Whedon uh, yeah. massacre. And I kept thinking, I'm like, is there something wrong with the theater projector? This movie looks like shit. <laughs> Why is it so bad? Why does it look so bad? And I and I'm like, no, it, it just it objectively looks that bad. When I saw Justice League, it looked like a porn version of Justice League. Right. Like it looked cheap and ugly and poorly lit, and the acting was bad. I was just expecting them to all start fucking each other. It was you know, it was very it was awful. Awful, awful, yeah. awful. And the flash doesn't look much better. Um, you know, I can't help it. I'm a little bit of a snack Zack Snyder fanboy. I know he's not perfect, but like he clearly had a vision. And when he was making the movies, they did make money. Yeah. Um, yeah. uh, and the farther away they get from what he was trying to do, the shittier they become and the less money they make. Yeah. The Notice more they, the pattern. Yeah. The more they try to just be like, uh, another Marvel 
cinematic yeah. universe, the the worse it gets. The real, the what they really should do with DC is instead of trying to build a DC universe, they just need to make really good one offs because that's what DC's good at. Whether it's Nolan's Batman movies or Tim Burton's Batman movies or Richard Donner's Superman or you know that Joker movie that came out a few years ago, right. like these one offs. Just be like content them. making television. Like they're making, they made some good TV. So, they made great TV. Yeah, I'll the Arrowverse. I think the DC animated universe is excellent. Yep. You know, the, yep. the you know the Bruce Tim stuff is incredible. Like they make really good Just, shit there. Yeah, no Marvel's kind of houses. Like and Marvel's <laughs> kind of the opposite. Where like right. the movies are good, but the TV is shit. Yeah, or at least the TV is not as good as the movies. I don't know. I haven't watched any of it. I haven't watched any Marvel stuff since Endgame because I don't care. But it's, it's uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, hopefully we're not getting too off track. I think this is all relevant to say that, like, clearly corporate consolidation is bad for yeah, companies. That's right. It's bad for writers. It's bad for actors. It's bad for musicians. It's bad for writers. And it's bad, bad for, for the consumer. It's bad for the consumer. And if we're going to start, if we're going to follow the Bork rule, right. then follow it. Because yeah. if this is all bad for the consumer. We're getting a shittier, more expensive product that we don't like. Yeah, like it's, it's, right. you know what I mean? And that's the same, you know, and so we need to build a world where we have universal licenses. So if you belong to a, like a studio, you get paid a set amount of money, no matter what. Yeah. Because that's how it should be structured. Um, you know, as sort of a reform, obviously we could talk about the revolutionary part of it and that's great, right. but like as a reform measure, like building in universal licensing and universal um, payments for licenses, that's the way to do it. Right. You know, you, you know, and you have this and you have licenses in perpetuity. Those matter a lot more than the copyright. So anyway, um, I think choke point capitalism is an excellent book. Um, I think clearly, I think it's, it's extremely relevant. I think for those of you who want to know, why did we get in this mess? You know, how did we get here? Why are the writers on strike? Why are the actors on strike? You know, read this book and you'll yeah. get a sense of like where we're at because these, hey, these really small handful of corporations are kind of running everything into the ground and cannibalizing the very industries that they're trying to perpetuate. Because that capitalism can't help itself. You know, it will constantly buy something, kill it, strip it of everything, and then sell off the bones. Yeah, it's, it, right. it doesn't, it just doesn't care. Because it doesn't value anything because no. it's all about the profit, right? Yeah. Because it's all about what will the second quarter earnings call look like. Yeah. That's all that matters. Yeah. And, you know, there's no responsibility to the community. There's no responsibility to consumers. There's no responsibility to producers. There's only responsibility to the shareholders. Yep. And when you have a model like that, it's no surprise that people are poor and live crappier lives and the planet is on fucking fire. <laughs> you know, like it's no yep. surprise that we're in the place that we're in. And I think that by understanding the media concentration and the way in which big tech has kind of choked out any sense of competition and any sense of real remuneration for people being creative um, that we've entered into this horrible landscape where, you know, pe you know, people should really care about this. People should care. People should care in general, yeah. but people should really care about this. If you love your DC movies, if you love listening to audiobooks, if you love jamming out to music, this stuff should matter to you. Yeah. You should care because we're going to live in a future where there's going to be a very small handful of companies, even smaller than today, who are going to have the vast control, basically the vast control over what ends up in your mind. Yep. And I think it's, I think it's just relevant to, to know that. And I think it's important for, for people to develop and fight back. Um, one other quick thing too, is that one of the solutions they have is if we could change laws, if we could have major reforms in New York and in California, it would affect most of the industry. Right. So you don't have to necessarily do it at the federal level because oft oftentimes getting stuff done at the federal level is almost impossible. Right. But on the state level, you can also do things too. So yeah. they also, since so, so much of the media industry is organized in, and big tech is organized in California, Washington, and New York and Massachusetts, Boston to a certain extent. If you can change the laws in like those four states and maybe a little bit of Texas, where a lot of uh, tort laws are started and a lot of crappy right. 
frivolous lawsuits are started in Texas. You can change the laws in those five states. You kind of change everything. And so that's another way of doing reform too. Um, okay. But anyway, yeah, people should definitely check this book out. It's excellent. I think Cory Doctorow is awesome. Um, and also, if you want to learn more and get really into the weeds with some of this, I highly recommend the interview that he did with Adam Conover. Oh, yep. On, yep. on Adam Conover's podcast, Factually. It yep. was a great deep dive that gets into the weeds on a lot of this that we didn't cover tonight. Um, and, and Adam Conover is a badass. I don't think it needs to be without saying. <laughs> I think when we look back on the history of this writer strike and – We'll look back and we'll say one of the guys who really made it all happen yeah, was Adam Conover for sure. because he's been, I think, incredible. So, so yeah, definitely check out Choke Point Capitalism. Um, you know, we all know we're in deep shit, but it's very important to know how and why we're in deep shit. Yeah, that's right. Because everybody knows it. I think everybody in their bones kind of feels that. They're like, we're we're in deep shit here, and so this is you know. Yeah, Adam, uh, some random geek says Adam has a lot of TikToks on the strikes. Yes, yes, he does. And they're great. Um, and talks about the ways that you can help artists, the way that you can help writers, you can help actors, and, and, and what they're asking for. You know, what they're asking for is not unreasonable. No. And it would, and it would literally, literally cost the studios a f like pennies on the dollar. It's nothing. But, you know, but they have to have everything. Yeah. Because you can't, because at some point it's not about money, it's about power. As some random geek said, right? Because yeah. if you give them an inch, they might take a mile and they should because CEOs are worthless. Yeah. Their goal is to be a choke point in the system and managers are worthless. And like these people, their job is to corral workers. That's the whole thing. Yeah. And they're not creative. You know, has anybody ever watched a movie that Bob Iger wrote or acted in? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. And if anything, he's remembered for I obviously being the guy who runs Disney, but also he's the guy who fucked up Twin Peaks. Yep. So if you want to know why Twin Peaks ended the way it did and why uh, David Lynch and Mark Frost didn't get to make the show they wanted to, it was because of Bob fucking Iger. So, yeah, because obviously executives have so much fucking wisdom. Right. Um. So, yeah. Anyway, they're worthless. They suck. And we should build a world where they don't exist. But until then... Let's break them up. And Sounds so, yeah, good. so that's choke, that's choke point capitalism. Awesome. So I guess, what are we covering next time? So next time, I decided. <laughs> you bumped you it for me. <laughs> I bumped it. So we won't be doing, we'll be doing uh, Revolutionary Affinities in a month. We'll be doing it the episode right. after the next one. The next one, we're going to pivot and we're going to talk about healthcare. Ah. Um, uh, because I, you know, re healthcare and dealing with the American healthcare system really radicalized me. And so, um, we're going to be talking about the book health communism, nice. um, which is a new book that's come out recently by Verso. Um, and really excited about reading it and talking about the ways in which we can, like with the internet, we can decommodify it and build a better world for everyone. So health communism, I think, will be really exciting to talk about. And then the two weeks after that, we'll be doing revolutionary affinities um, about Marxism and anarchism and the solidarity between the two. So I'm looking forward to that book. And that gives my dear friend some time. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's it gives, very good quite so frankly, far, but it's... Fr quite frankly, it gives me time to read it too. Yeah. Let's, yeah. Just, let's just be real. Um, because that's going to be a theory heavy episode and history heavy episode. And I, and I want it to be good. So, yep, sure. so yeah, so we've got a lot of good stuff coming down the pike. Um, this was originally scheduled to be a sort of live stream Q and a, right. and then we had decided to do a full episode. Um, but we'll probably do another live stream in August. We'll have to kind of coordinate and figure out what, what day we're going to do in August to do a live stream, um, and, uh, figure out the topic and all that jazz. So, but yeah, that's, that's what we'll be doing next couple episodes. Right on. And I guess, where can people find you? So you can find me at justinclark.org, <laughs> right down there. Um, that's where all my writing and all the podcast episodes are. Um, my latest piece is on Bertrand Russell and the four-hour workday and his radical ideas of a world beyond work um, that we talked about in the episode on In Praise of Idleness. Um, so you can check that out. I'm a regular contributor to the Truth Seeker magazine. So um, my latest uh, column in that was a review of Christopher Hitchens' God is Not Great, which we also talked about on the show. Um, you can check that out at the blog as well. Um, and last but not least, um, I highly encourage people to check out Corey's uh, Patreon. Um, become a patron. Uh, he works very, very hard. 
And as you can tell, my man's got a little thing going on in the throat. <laughs> yeah. So he's going to need more for the, the, the honey and tea budget. That's right. Um, yeah. So, you know, keep him, we got to keep him, we got to keep him flush with tea and honey. Um, and also, Corey has also set up a sub stack. Yes. Um, go check out the sub stack. I'm excited about that as well. Um, will that be the podcast episodes and also writing or? Yeah, yeah that's the idea. It's going to be. Okay. Like a podcast episode plus whatever I happen to want to write about that particular cool. day. Cool. So. That's awesome. That's really exciting. That's fantastic. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's great. So yeah, definitely check out that stuff. And then um, you can also follow me on Instagram and threads because I am on threads. Um, but still fuck Zuckerberg. Um, <laughs> but uh, Instagram and threads at Justin Clark PH. Um, yes. Thank you, Corey, for your You're labor while you suffer through yeah. sore throat. Yes. Yes, which may or may not be because of the tree fumes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're not entirely sure. Not entirely sure. Um, but anyway, yeah, so you can follow me at Justin Clark PH. PH is for public history on Instagram and threads, where I regularly post about book reviews and anything else that kind of comes up. Um, and I really appreciate it. I'm getting close to a thousand followers on Instagram. Nice. Um, and I, I'm not trying to like ch be a clout chaser, but I'm really excited to cross that threshold. Right. Um, so hopefully we'll get there someday. I'm at 975, I think. Um, Pretty good. Uh, but anyway, yeah. So, um, so, you know, do that. And, um, and, and as always, thank you so much for some random geek and all of the reviewers who watch when we do it live. And thank you for all your great comments and your suggestions. Um, sure. they are, they are wonderful. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody. And, uh, see you in a couple of weeks. See you in a couple of weeks. All right. That's all folks. Thanks for watching and or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and it helps me keep the internet and the power on. Thanks to my top patrons, Some Random Geek, Damien Marie at Hope, Justin Clark, Christopher Taylor, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can send a one-time donation at, to me at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a like on YouTube or a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes for links to all my stuff or check out my website, skepticalleftist.com. That's where you can find all of my social media spaces and communities. Uh, or you can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening or watching. Make sure to leave a comment on the video or on my website. Join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda. 